So before we get into Pam, because our presentation is mostly about privileged access management, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we talked about last year, which is really maturing your identity and access management tool, your IGA tool, SailPoint, in the ways that Ross has talked about. How do you do lifecycle management, access certification? And we condensed our talk from last year into a nice brochure with six steps. So um, if you are interested in that, that's at our booth. Um, but today we are going to be talking about PAM and, and really what is imperative for when you are rolling out a new PAM tool um, and when you, when you have a new PAM program. Um, what we have seen as, as kind of the lessons learned from our implementations. Um, so here's our cover slide. Uh, so I am Kathy Hall. A lot of you probably know me from the last two years on CDM uh, CRUD Management Phase 2. Um, but I have about 15 years of experience in consulting uh, or more um, and, and have focused kind of the last decade on identity um, and privilege. My name is Mark Phelan. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity architect as well, and I've been focusing on IAM, IGA, and PAM over the last five years. So before we get into, can you guys hear me? All right. Before we get into the paper vault and why it's important to prevent the paper vault, let's talk about what we mean by PAM and why it's important. So our definition of privilege access management is the practice of managing, securing, and governing administrator access. What do we mean by that? Well. Really, we want to make sure that your policies, your controls, and your overall governance are effective, and they align with your organization's uh, leveraging of these privileged accounts. Um, we, we want uh, anybody that's taking on PAM to really look at their broad lens of security, but from an administrator's point of view. Um, and why PAM? Well, you know, as, as you've probably heard before already today, 80% um, of breaches use privilege account and, and the, the, um, the escalation of people into privilege access um, some, in some way. So really any organization, federal, commercial, large, small, really needs to make this a priority. Um, Gartner and uh, Forcher recently rated uh, PAM or PIM, depending on who you talk to, um, as the number one concern that CISO should be looking into this year and probably into the next year and, and in years to come. And the, the problem of privileged access is pervasive and complex. We have a number of different access methods. So people are getting to their, their privileged accounts using SSH, using RDP, using TOAD. There's just a ton of different ways you have to lock down this access. Um, you have high levels of access. You have DBAs, you have root, you have local administrators, you have all these different ways for people to get really, really elevated privileges. And then the proliferation of accounts. We already talked about built-in accounts. Um, so changing those passwords that are in your installation guides, that's really important. But then securing those built-in accounts. How do you secure SP admin? How do you secure root? Um, and, and why do people roll out PAM tools? What are the things that they like about CyberArk? What are the things they like about CA PAM? What is it that they're doing when they're rolling out a PAM tool? Well, the first and the most important thing is the actual vault itself, right? So how are you going to secure your passwords um, in a way that allows you to have very long, very secure, unmemorable passwords that aren't sitting on a, a post-it note that then you share around with people when they need that privilege access? But then there's a lot of other features, right? The, one of the main things you want to do is remove anonymity. When you share a root <coughs> account or when you share a root <coughs> password, you have no idea who it is that's using that root account with their privileges. So when you want, what, you, what you really, really want to do is remove the anonymity from the system when somebody is using their privileged accounts. Controlling and proxying your administrative session. So you want to know who's using it at any particular time, but you also now want to know why, what they're doing with it. Uh, and then um, last and, and really more importantly, use it. Do I turn this on? Okay. Um, is integration with integrating with your other control technologies, things like your MFA, your SSO, your IGA tool, of course, because if you are not governing PAM, you're not really doing PAM. So, um, oops, still need this. Um, and, and really what we're trying to say here is the, the risk of granting perpetual access to your privilege to your privileged accounts is too high for any organization. So you need to think through when and how you're granting that access and what people are doing with it. All right, so 
before we get to talking about securing the paper vault, let's talk a little bit about the typical approaches we see when we're dealing with uh, PAM implementation. Um, so the typical drivers are what we've talked about already, right? It's Gartner and Forrester are saying this is the important thing everyone needs to consider. Your CISO, it's on their radar. It's a compliance-driven initiative that must be completed by the end of the year. So what does that mean? What are the next steps? Well, likely you have a roadmap that is largely incomplete uh, for initial state or future state, uh, governance and implementation. So, and uh, a scope that is largely defined as we must implement a PAM tool to secure our privilege access. And they've assigned a director, likely many of you out in the audience, um, to initiate this and to run the program, to define the scope, to select the tool, to build out the requirements, and to assemble a team that can do it. So you're doing your homework, you've researched uh, the market, you've looked at the different tools, and you're likely coming to a conference like this to get more information, right? So all that's left is really just the implementation. And while this slide looks very commercial in its nature, all of these things, this is why we say it doesn't matter if you're small or large, it doesn't matter if you're commercial or federal, all of the priorities are the same. Almost always a PAM tool is a compliance driven initiative. There just happens to be even more compliance on the federal side, right? There is, there is FISMA, there is all these things. CDM is the thing that, that prompted a lot of people to, to make PAM the priority, but there was a, you know, maybe it's not always the end of year, end of quarter, but it is absolutely the end of the period of performance of the contract. So trying to get this done within a certain time frame is very common. And no one wants to be the next headline or the next magazine cover, right? Absolutely. So what you typically get to implement then? The creation of privilege shared accounts for all your different administration teams, right? That's considered best practice by different vendors and across the industry. Uh, configuration of a single sign-on tool, right? You now need to grant all your end users access to the tool. So why not just lump it in with all the other applications you have in your enterprise to access uh, the PAM tool you've selected? And then access. You need to figure out what they can access in uh, the solution and why not use AD? It's already being leveraged across the company to uh, do access for other end applications. So let's uh, add in the PAM tool as well. And I'd like to talk a little bit about why shared accounts are kind of considered best practice by the vendors. Um, if you think about the proliferation of accounts that I was talking about before, the way a lot of organizations, federal or commercial, have granted privilege access in the past has been with what we call secondary admin accounts. So I have my account and then I have my admin account. But if you think about how many accounts get created with a high level of privilege given that given that method, then the controls that you have to put in place for that many number of accounts and the vulnerability that you have, the amount of accounts with privilege access that could get compromised is much larger. And so by creating these role-based shared accounts, you're limiting how many accounts you yeah, have. Reducing that threat landscape and really trying to reduce the number of accounts with privilege access and the amount of privilege access each account has. So what do we mean by the paper vault, right? We've put this thing together. We talked specifically about the vault itself and how secure it is. It's got these great passwords in it. They're long, they're unmemorable. So if you look at it from the front, right, we put this vault together. It is secure, it's impenetrable, it's got a security guard, it's great. Um, but if you take a look at it from another lens, you can, you can, a different perspective, you can sort of see these holes that you've created in this vault itself that is holding your crown jewels. It's holding your privileged access. So, and they may allow breaches or bad actors access to this thing. So we really wanna talk about how to prevent a paper vault from three different perspectives. Um, one is securing the vault itself. How do you make sure that this vault that you've created is secure? And we're gonna talk about three different things when we do that. We're gonna talk about authentication, we're gonna talk about anonymity, and we're gonna talk about authorization. But then even more importantly is, well maybe not more important, but also as important is the change management and adoption processes that you are putting in place for this PAM tool. If you think about it, an IGA tool is important, incredibly important, it provides governance, but how much are you changing people's day to day? Not that much. What you are changing is how they get access to the things, but when you implement a PAM tool, you are changing how they do their job, their everyday job, and so that's a really important thing to to keep in mind as you're rolling this out. And then control and visibility. The whole point of granting or creating a 
uh, PAM program and putting a PAM tool in place is to, to grant some level of control and visibility into what people are doing with that privilege access. So these are kind of the three things we're going to talk about now. So securing that vault, that authentication, single sign-on isn't enough. With the spear phishing attack, the main attacker is going to go after your typical user credentials, right? What you're using to log in to your end computer. They're then now able to traverse directly to your crown jewels in your vault via the SSO that you've enabled, and they have full access to all your highly privileged accounts. Not ideal. So you need some friction. You need that increased authentication. You need to know who is on the other end of that keyboard. What is their identity? So you add the friction of an MFA tool, for example, and immediately lock down and prevent them traversing to the vault and your privileged access. So they can spearfish those end users all they want, but they don't have any privileged access to uh, get to. So then the next piece, removing the anonymity. <laughs> How is privileged access being used and by whom? Key question. So your initial state, what likely is across all of uh, enterprises now, is secondary privileged accounts. You have your, mine would be mfeelin account that I use to log into my computer um, and check my email. But for any privileged access I have to a database or a server, um, I would have mfeelin underscore admin, right? Typical scenario you see. You know who that user is. You can tie the logs and what their activity is directly to that person. You know their identity. But now with the paper vault, by going with the best practice to try to reduce that landscape of privileged access, you've created an anonymity. You've created anonymous activity that you don't, can't tie to a specific user, right? You have a single account that is a shared account, and now five people could be using it at the same time. Which of those five people did an action? Eh, I don't know. So immediately you have to lock it down. You can only have one person using an account at a time unless you can tie what they're doing to the person. So there's a few different ways that you can do this. Ideally, to initially drop that risk immediately and have success and win off the bat, you vault their secondary accounts. It keeps their processes simple and enables you to immediately reduce that risk, while then you're still continuing to move to the long-term goal of the shared accounts along with session management, which can tell you what they're doing with those shared accounts and who is doing it. <clears throat> Authorization. So as we talked about, Active Directory is a common way to provide and determine what kind of access someone should be using in a PAM solution, but it's not quite enough. With Active Directory, you've increased your landscape by externalizing your authorization to a new third party, right? So any insider now that has access to Active Directory or is an admin on Active Directory can elevate and change membership to those highly sensitive privileged groups. So now you have potentially unauthorized access to that vaulted uh, credentials. So a direct integration between PAM and other controls like an IGA solution, like Identity IQ, can lock down and prevent that elevation of access, can force approvals, can ensure that you're governing and controlling the access that now is contained in this single solution um, and have policies to prevent unauthorized escalation going forward. And, and if you think about what you're doing by externalizing to AD, what you are doing is adding to almost every organization's already existing AD problem, right? Everybody author, uh, externalizes their authorization to AD using AD groups. But the problem there now is you know, what we see in the sale point implementation every time, how do you know what an AD group actually grants access to? And keep in mind that every single AD group that we're going to have here that controls access to the vault will be highly privileged access. So how are we noting that somewhere in AD so that you know that these are really, really highly privileged entitlements? So we'll get to that in another slide. But that's, it's a really important problem that you're really just adding to. And uh, Kathy paused a little bit about whether she would say that this is the biggest uh, potential hurdle. I would argue it is, because if you don't focus on change management and adoption, it can just die on the vine right there. And there goes the whole program and everything you've worked for. So ensuring that you have partners with your end, um, impl your end uh, admins that you're changing their processes, you're changing their day to day. Unlike implementing maybe a governance solution where you're just changing how they request access, by implementing a PAM tool, you're really inserting yourself, ideally, that's the point, um, into their day to day activities. So chasing a best practice implementation while ignoring the training and the business impacts that that's going to have on them will re reduce adoption and really drag out the whole process overall. So you really need to focus on going with the quick wins, doing what is going to tr easily transition um, your admins over to the new tool and increase adoption over the long run and ensure you're successful. 
and this one hits really close ho to home for me because I actually just got back from, you know, a month ago, got back from a trip visiting my parents, and this is one of the most proud moments of my life as a security professional. I was finally successfully able to get my dad to use a uh, uh, password vault. So, <laughs> success! Um, it was great. But why? Why was this successful when I wasn't before? Well, what did I do before that was wrong? Well. I talked to him and I, I asked him where all of his passwords were and we went and we vaulted every single one of them and I changed every single one of them to a long, random, hard to, hard to crack, really hard to remember password, right? And we got him using the password vault, I was there for a week and then I'd leave. And then what would happen was he would try to get into his financial institution to pay his bills. And a little glitch would happen, one thing would go wrong, and he would get frustrated, and the first thing he would do is go and reset every single one of those passwords back to that safe password that he had on his sticky note on his screen. Because this was a crucial part of his job, this was a crucial part of his life. Paying those bills is important, right? So what did I do differently this time? Well, I sat with him and I took all his passwords as they were today and I vaulted them just as they were. Because yes, it's not the most secure password in the world, but it's there and it's vaulted. And then we spent months, all year pretty much, getting him used to using that vault. Getting him to log into the vault first and hit the launch button on that thing for getting to his banks. And then when little glitches happened, I walked him through it or he fell back to the password he already knew because that was the password that was his. Once he was comfortable with the vault, once he'd been using it for six months, then we started to change one password after another. And I worked with him through that whole process as a partner. <laughs> and just recently we, we managed to change his last password and he felt really, really comfortable with it. And that is the most important thing. So while I know that your administrators are probably more tech savvy than my dad, I would imagine, um, I, do, I do think that the story is the same, right? If you're gonna change something that's critical to their job function, critical to their life, then you need to make sure that you are, you are going with them the whole way because what's gonna usually happen is there's gonna be resistance and a, a tendency to revert to the norm. Um, so. Well, one would think that uh, admins are very different from uh, a dad. Uh, I think you'll find that they're much more alike when you're trying to change their processes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and then so the final point is really around control and visibility. So again, integrating with those partners, those control partners like your IGA tool especially, and you'll see the examples here, three of them look very familiar when you talk about SailPoint. Um, so let's go through them right now. Access certifications. So you guys are probably running your access certifications on a regular basis and you want to be able to say that somebody ha somebody's access is actually valid and they should continue to have it. Well, a lot of times, somebody has a lot of access. So how do you tell whether or not that access is privileged? If you can feed that information to the, from the PAM tool into your IGA tool to, to note something as privileged, you're much less likely to get rubber stamping on your certifications. And no one's just gonna go, yeah, this person has that access and so they should, when it's very, very clear to them that that access is privileged. Same thing for access requests. They're basically the, the, the same problem. If somebody is asking for access to a particular, AD group that grants access to the timesheet. Well, great, then I'll, sure. But if they're asking for access to an AD group that gives them access to a vault that gives them all domain passwords for all domain user, um, or not domain user, domain admins for every domain, um, every AD domain in your network, well, then that's a little different, right? And I'm gonna think about it a little more. Um, Lifecycle events, as we all know, we've been talking about onboarding and offboarding, but this is where the story about my dad kind of ties in. If you're setting up a personal vault, like a personal, like a last pass, say, then when that person leaves the organization, they're taking those passwords with them. If you're gonna set up a CyberArk, you're gonna set up a, a CAPAM, what you are gonna do is you're gonna integrate with your IDA tool so you can take away their access to those highly privileged accounts when they no longer need them. Either they're leaving the organization or they're changing their role. And you can grant them the access they need to these highly privileged entitlements or pri highly privileged accounts when they do need them, sometimes even when they're joining the organization. Um, so this is where the SailPoint and PAM integration is, is crucial, and, and it's really important to talk about these at a, at, a, at a level where if you think about, you know, when you set up a PAM tool, you're, you are creating a, a snapshot of how your business works today, but until you can actually integrate with these access requests, with these certifications, with these lifecycle events, you're not changing how, how your, your uh, privilege access will work as your business grows. People are gonna be onboarded, people are gonna be offboarded, 
uh, some of these privilege accounts are going to be given more access or access is going to be taken away from them. And people are going to be given access to these accounts and that's going to be taken away. And until you get this integration right, you're not really, you're, you're not really growing with your business. The other two are also very critically important. Incident response, this is actually integrating with your, your security operations center, your SOC. This is how you get that feedback loop of, we found an incident, it's, it has to do with one particular comp uh, compromised credential, but let's go take a look at what that compromised credential may also have access to, and let's also lock all of that down. Or let's feed that information to the SOC so they can take a look at whether or not other anomalies are happening with those accounts. Um, and then your analytics and reporting tools, you, what you really want to do is make sure that all the controls you're putting in place are valid and they are efficient. And what we talked about way at the beginning in defining PAM. And how do you do that? By constantly running analytics, constantly feeding this information back to your reporting engine to say, are my controls effective? Are they working? And, and this is where the dashboard comes in for CDM. They're, you're constantly validating those controls. Um, just one quick thing on the uh, life cycle events uh, I see across organizations is really the onboarding and offboarding. There are numerous accounts, very privileged accounts, built-in accounts, service accounts that are likely ignored currently with offboarding because the person that first set up, that up that knows that what, exactly what it does left 20 years ago and it just sits there. So it's a huge win to be able to start to understand and doing that discovery process of vaulting things to understand what the life cycle of that account should be and uh, start to lock that down by integrating it with a governance tool that is handling it for the rest of your accounts and your people. Um, so that's a win that largely gets understated as well. Absolutely. And then really just the main takeaway, right? PAM is a complex problem to solve. So to avoid that paper vault that we talked about, what you really want to do is evaluate the impact of all the decisions you make in the whole process of rolling out this tool. And then make sure that you integrate with your critical control partners at a very minimum so that you are growing, growing this PAM tool with your business. And we really talked about the three things. We just kind of wanted to note them again here. Securing the vault itself, making sure you have change management and adoption procedures, uh, and you're thinking through what that looks like, and that you're, you're integrating with those control partners for control and visibility. And that's it. Thank you very much. You. Are there any questions? Again, we're like, we're like Ross, we're, we're killing it. Oh. <laughs> Please wait for the mic to come to you. Oops. Thank you. Hold on one second. One second. Coming. How do you know that you can actually trust the vault? That, uh, that feeds into that, that reporting in the analytics engine of, of the, the, the data that you're getting around merging together, not just who has access to what, and what those things have access to, but then the activity data of what they're doing with that access. Because then you can start to actually validate all of your controls in that analytics engine or in that reporting engine. Um, but maybe Mark also so, has some thoughts. Yeah, so I would argue with any new tool you're implementing, the only way you can really be sure is by having controls and activity visibility. Um, that analytics engine and that usage data is really what's going to provide you that feedback loop of saying, OK, I know it's controlled because I have this sort of third party external eye on it that is telling me that no one has accessed those accounts or those servers without me knowing about it. Awesome. Great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>